Okay, so hello AYT viewers. Uh, this is Lindsay here being joined by the wonderful Lynn Gardner today. Uh, we're very thankful to have her. So Lynn is an internationally renowned journalist and novelist, currently an associate editor of The Stage. She has written about theatre and performance for The Guardian and The Independent. Uh, founding member of City Limits, the largest publishing co-op in Europe no small things. And she's also uh, the author of novels for children, which include Into the Woods, Out of the Woods, the Ghost Ghostly McNasty series, the Olivia Stage School, and Rose Campion novels as well. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Lindsay. <laughs> Is there anything that I've missed out there? Anything that you'd like to add uh, to the yeah, list? Actually, that I also review for uh, an app called Stage Door. Uh, which London-based app, which is really comprehensive uh, in terms of listing all the theatre that's on in London. Fantastic. I've heard very good things about it. So I guess we'll start at the beginning, uh, a very good place to start. How did you find yourself on this path to theatre criticism and just writing about the love of theatre and performance in general? Um, I think like lots of people who end up uh, doing criticism, uh, I, I, it was by accident. Uh, uh, I guess I grew up thinking that maybe I might act. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to a school where there were, uh, I went to a local grammar school and there were lots of opportunities um, to actually put on plays and be in plays. So when I was at school, I directed something once a year in what was a kind of interform kind of competition. Uh, and uh, then when I went to university, I directed a lot. Um, but I would say that when I was at university, I sort of come from a generation that's sort of a bit older than Deborah Warner and Katie Mitchell and people like that. And um, I just didn't know when I left university how you went about being a, um, a theatre director yeah. uh, and I also didn't know about any role models. Uh, the only um, female theatre director I knew was uh, Buzz Goodbody who had worked for the RSC and uh, had in fact killed herself. Um, so uh, I sort of didn't really know how to go about being a director but I did love theatre and I knew how you could go about writing about it. Brilliant. I found a quotation on the kind of investigation into, into your past that I really liked. And it said from at, at the that, beginning... That sounds really sinister, Lindsay. I'm sorry? That sounds really sinister. You're <laughs> invest <laughs> doing my <laughs> digging. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, the isolation has taken its toll in. What can I say? <laughs> Um, found a quotation along the, the digging. Um, so towards the beginning of your career, you said that there um, are now a lot more people writing about theater than when you first started out. So when, uh, when there were about 20 people in the whole country, most of whom were men, and that must have been quite a field to have entered into at the time. Uh, yeah, I think that it was. Uh, uh, I think that I was aware of it. And I think one of the things that, um, I became increasingly aware of was uh, the way that uh, gender and background and, uh, uh, and your education affects how it is that you review. So a really good example of that, I think, would be, you know, in the 1980s, I kept on reading reviews. There was a kind of wave of female writers at the time, people like Sarah Daniels, Louise Page, um, who were writing uh, plays which often had quite high profile productions. And yet I was really aware that the way that uh, men often reviewed those plays and how they talked about the structure of those plays that perhaps didn't follow uh, uh, traditional structures of mm -hmm. three actors that often in fact uh, also perhaps would use lots of uh, visual techniques in some cases would be devised um, that it felt to me that those were often seen by my colleagues as being failings rather than potentially uh, being just a different way of doing things mm -hmm. and a um, you know a really uh, potentially interesting one yeah 
very well put. And it kind of leads me on to another quotation that I found along the way. Um, and part of the reason I think why AYT is so excited to have you here is that you've always been kind of nurturing uh, of theater and performance at kind of every stage, every echelon of the process. Um, the quotation here says, I've tried to be a midwife and not a gatekeeper with my blogs in reference to the Guardian blogs. Um, and my blog has allowed me to support theater ecology at all levels. Um, so would you like to expand kind of on what that means in that case to be a midwife? And I guess, how do you believe that some people are being kept out by the so-called gatekeepers? Um, well, I think it happens all across theatre, and I think it actually um, it affects criticism and critics as much as it affects uh, makers. Interesting. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things that, in terms of criticism, that has shifted enormously is about the fact that anybody can be a critic. Coming back to the quote that you uh, mentioned earlier about only about 20 people were writing. And that was because people needed a platform uh, in order to uh, write publicly about theatre. Mm. And one of the that's great now, of course, is that anyone can have a platform because anyone can do a WordPress blog or, you know, uh, set themselves up with a platform on the internet. And I think that can only be a good thing for um, theatre. Uh, uh, but I think the wider point in terms of kind of trying to support the ecology is, um, uh, you know, I think it is really, really easy, inevitably as a critic, you are some form of gatekeeper. And I think you need to keep that in your head. And I don't think it matters where you're writing. I don't think it matters whether you're writing for a broadsheet newspaper or whether you're writing on your own blog. Uh, or whether uh, you, you're writing like I do now on an app. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there is something about uh, your voice being amplified by the platform. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's really important to be aware of your privilege and think about where you're coming from and why it is that you respond to things in the way that you do. And I think going back again, I think that was one of the lessons I learned when I worked at City Limits during the 1980s, uh, that um, criticism doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, it happens uh, as a result of who you are, where you came from, uh, what your interests are. Uh, and what your privilege is. So um, I think that I've seen criticism as a way of trying to open doors uh, and um, uh, helping people in some way, in what little way that I can to gain access. And I think because we all know what um, uh, our theatre culture is like, I think it's been very slow to give that access to people. And it's still the case that, um, you know, that what is reviewed is mostly very high profile stuff. It's things that are at the National, at the RSC, at the big subsidised houses and in the West End. Uh, and it is often uh, those people who are working in the independent sector who not only find that when they knock on doors uh, of um, funded theatre or commercial theatre, uh, they get no response, but actually, I think they're neglected by criticism as well. Mm -hmm. It's very well put, and we have a whole kind of army of reviewers at a younger theatre who do it on a voluntary basis, but get obviously the tickets to things. And it's it's amazing to see the kind of the wealth of of actual talent that is out there, and people just so keen to you know have have a kind of say, have a sort of um, a word thrown into this massive exciting kind of melting pot that is theatre around this country. Um, have you any tips? I mean, I, I know you said how, how difficult it is and there is still an inherent kind of privileged structure therein, but have you any tips for someone who might um, be one of our AYT reviewers, for instance, and is kind of at the, at the very beginning of this sort of long journey and just sort of feeling it out, you know, in terms of getting those underrepresented voices in there? Um, I think one of the things that's uh, really important to remember um, is you're not doing an exam, yes? Uh, there was no right or wrong answer. And I think that it really, really frees you up when you uh, go to the theatre and you just go, oh, yeah, I am going to have to write about this after I've seen this, um, but all I'm writing about is my response 
to it. Uh, and I think rather than uh, feeling that in some way that you've got to give the right response mm -hmm. to it. Uh, and the other thing that I would say is that, you know, I've been writing about theatre since the 1980s and there are still loads of nights in the theatre where I go and I go, I don't really know what that is. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't understand it. And I think it's really easy to feel kind of incredibly panicked by that. Yeah. Uh, whereas, in fact, as you say, as I say, if all you do is go, oh, this, I'm now going to write what my response is. Uh, it doesn't matter, actually, uh, if you maybe didn't quite understand it or it's just about actually a generosity in opening your up, yourself up mm -hmm. uh, to actually um, meet what is being offered to you from the stage and then to respond back, I think, with an open heart as well. Yeah. And you're not trying to, I guess, sort of sit on top of a pedestal and, you know, defame anyone or or you know close the gates off as the metaphor continues but but actually I think I've never heard it phrased like that but it, it is a human meeting a human art form kind of thing and what people actually want is your own human response to that thing to whatever that was and even if it is some people might like it I didn't or even if it is I've no idea what the heck I just saw there that's all legitimate <laughs> Of course it's legitimate. And I think one of the things that's actually fantastic about the shifts and changes that have taken place in criticism about who it's not just about who potentially gets a chance to have their say about theatre and anything that broadens the conversation around and about theatre is a good thing for theatre. But I also think it's about the fact that um, the new platforms that have emerged allow people to be much freer in the way that they actually write about theatre. And I think that's a really interesting thing. You know, if you write for a broadsheet, there is absolutely no way that you could ever file your review as a haiku, you know, or <laughs> uh, file your review in the form of a sonnet that just, you know, would not be possible. Yeah. Uh, but actually, one of the great things, um, you know, uh, about the number of bloggers that we have is that, or um, sites such as a younger theatre or Exeunt, for example, mm -hmm. is about the fact that it allows people often to write criticism that feels in many ways as uh, creative as uh, the piece of art that the person is writing about. That's beautiful, because I think some of the reasons why I've personally kind of feared theatre criticism as a thing is, is I guess, like shutting someone's, <laughs> shutting someone's dreams down preemptively, I guess. But this seems like a much more open hearted kind of way. And, and if you do approach it as one person's opin opinion, opinion or, or felt experience, then it doesn't, it doesn't, the buck doesn't stop with you, I guess. You can acknowledge yeah. that there were people in the room that might have loved it when you yourself might have had the opposite response and that's that's okay yeah no i think that's true as i say i think it's quite freeing mm -hmm. i mean you know don't get me wrong i have been known to kind of absolutely lay into productions that perhaps mm -hmm. i felt were you know really cynical or mm -hmm. uh you know, are kind of not serving the art form well and really perhaps are kind of just, you know, about making lots and lots of money. Uh, you know, I'm not above writing, uh, you know, the, uh, the review that is really, really waspish. Mm -hmm. But I was very careful about how and when I do do that. Yeah, I think that's very well said. So on, along those lines, are there any productions that you've seen that have stuck with you for whatever reason, either towards like the, the transcendent kind of take your breath away theatrical experience down to the opposite end of the spectrum? Anything that sticks out in your years of theatre well, I, I suppose in the opposite end of the spectrum, i.e. the waspish sort of review of something that I suppose have written about in a more cynical manner because I think I am responding to something that I have identified as being as cynical in itself, you know, would be something like Menopause the Musical or Peter Pan L Musical. Uh, you can look those shows up online, my reviews will be there. Um, uh, but actually, you know, uh, the 
thing that is much more enjoyable in theatre is, of course, those nights which are transcendent in some way. Uh, uh, and, and I sometimes think that one of the reasons that I feel so lucky to do the job that I do is, um, you know, how many people have a job where maybe half a dozen times a year they go and see something which is so utterly sublime that just feels as though it is so talking directly to you that you have the opportunity of kind of falling in love with the art form um you know that uh, uh, uh that you see so regularly you know in my case maybe five or six nights a week um mm -hmm. and get all that rush of hormones that you get when you fall in love and it is just completely glorious and gosh, I've had so many nights in the theater like that. Um, uh, and often they have been uh, with companies who perhaps are actually exploring a different form of engagement with an audience. So the real example of things like that, I would say would be um, a number of early punch drunk shows. Uh, they would be things like National Theater Wales and Wild Works. Um, uh, the Passion, uh, which took place over, in fact, an Easter weekend uh, in Port Talbot uh, a number of years ago. Um, they would be shows like uh, uh, John Tiffany and uh, Gregory Burke's uh, Black Watch. Uh, they would be endless numbers of knee-high shows uh, directed by Emma Rice uh, from The Red Shoes through to Tristan and his older, just absolutely kind of gets you where it hurts. That's so beautiful. And you know, it's interesting. I spoke to, to Simon Stevens last week and that same kind of the ability to still be blown away by, by the work that you're seeing, the work that you get to be a part of um, in whatever capacity is, is still for both of you, I think, so alive and so, so present and, and, and still stimulating, which I think is a really lovely thing. I've, I've encountered a few people who seem that the, the light has kind of faded a little bit and I think among the people who are our kind of luminaries and the people that I sort of would like to emulate in my own practice would be people like yourselves who, who have that, still have that fire and that love for the art form that you've devoted your lives to. So just a comment, but <laughs> absolutely in love with that. I you say, I mean, I often think that, um, you know, you sometimes hear that thing about that critics are jaded and, uh, to some degree, I mean, I would say, uh, I think it's easy to get tired uh, and that one shouldn't underestimate if you go to the theatre, you know, five nights a week, uh, how exhausting that can be. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's really possible to be a critic and to be jaded because actually I think you just simply wouldn't get out of bed in the morning uh, to go and see the next show. Uh, uh, because again, you know, having said the things that have the, the, those wonderful shows where you're just knocked sideways, but I also think that um, there is something, um, you know, a lot of theatre, and I think we don't really acknowledge it enough, a lot of theatre is just so-so, it's okay, uh, it's not bad, and it's not fantastic, it's just somewhere in between, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so I guess an interesting direction would go in now, and it might be a very brief section of the interview, but I guess what has life been like for you in the age of self-isolation and quarantine? Yeah, well, obviously I've not been going to the theatre, uh, and that in itself is kind of quite interesting not to do that. And in fact, I've moved in with my dad, who is 92, so I've moved in uh, to his house in order to try and shield him a bit so that I can go and do the shopping and uh, uh, and things. Uh, and of course, actually, in many ways, uh, it's been very lovely uh, because uh, it's been an opportunity to spend time together uh, in a way that, uh, I mean, I see a lot of him anyway, but in a way, uh, a more extended uh, version of, you know, what would normally happen. So, you know, that's been very good. Yeah. Uh, I've enjoyed it. But yes, um, I am missing theatre. Uh, but I would also say I'm probably less tired than I've ever been in my life, you know, because I'm not going out to the theatre every single night and I'm tending to go to bed at the same time and get up at the 
same time. Yeah. Some so. routine. Wow. <laughs> Not often. Um, have you, do you have any sort of personal thoughts? It might be a bit of a volatile subject, but any personal thoughts on the kind of massive shift of things moving towards the online sphere, whether it be recorded anti-live productions or things kind of purpose made for the online sphere? Have you any thoughts about those? I think it's really interesting and I think that there is something and I've written a blog actually in the stage today around uh, the idea that I think that theatre is uh, is quite bound up with the idea that it needs to produce product and lots of product and I think that what that does mean is that when the lockdown has occurred uh, I think lots of people have gone or how do we now produce product? Um, and some of those things that have, and I think will come out of it, I think are really genuinely very interesting. Uh, but I think there is a difference between taking perhaps a deep breath and uh, thinking about how it is that you um, might engage an audience in a different way when you're not in a live space together uh, and simply perhaps going oh we've got these old recordings you know somewhere at the back of the computer and we will shove them online uh, so I you know I think it's that instinct to just put stuff up there I think is completely understandable I think there's a kind of feeling of theatre feeling a little bit scared that everybody is going to forget about theatre. Uh, whereas I'd actually say that one of the things I think that is glorious about theatre is that, you know, people carry theatre and the memories of the things that they have seen around in their heads, I think in a really, really vivid way. Um, and so therefore it just might be the case that uh, then to put a, um, sort of a, a theatre light version of something online uh, uh, may not be doing the best possible service to the work itself or indeed to theatre more generally. Yeah. Having said that, I also think there are kind of quite interesting things. I've been, for example, live tweeting the National Theatre uh, shows that have been going out online and that of course it's not the same as being in the theatre uh, of course it's not but sometimes different can also be just as interesting uh, it can also be just as tasty you know the sort of analogy that i'd use would be you know it's like tinned peaches and fresh peaches are entirely different but actually they're both quite delicious yeah uh, and i but i think there is something about the engagement when you are engaging uh, not just with what you are watching through your screen, but also feel as though you are engaging with a community of people who are also simultaneously watching, that I think is potentially quite interesting. Um, and I suppose, again, it's not the same as the live experience, but I think it has some of the excitement and frizzle of the live experience, yeah. Yeah. It, for what it what it's really clarified for me is the idea that the the audience is is so integral to any kind of piece of theater but like you say the things that are being like live tweeted to or even like the globe when they put uh, the hamlet up on uh, on the youtube as a, like a live sort of performance you almost had like groundling style comments coming in in the chat box at the side similar things are happening with they must go online and that kind of stuff and and yeah. to me those things that have the audience kind of at its at its heart you know, um, it, it feels like, like you say, it's a different, it's a different kind of peach, but it's, you never actually have in the National Theatre or even in the Globe in the Groundling, the true Groundling experience, you wouldn't have people shouting out or booing or hissing or, you know, whooping and hollering in the way that these comments seem to be sort of um, yeah. uh, indicating, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I think those things are interesting and I rather suspect that as time goes by, it will be an opportunity to rethink uh, its relationship with the digital. And, and, you know, the truth is, people probably in the last month 
working in theatre in some cases, in many cases, might have given more thought to digital than they probably have during the previous three years. Yeah? <laughs> uh, and I think that can only be a kind of good thing because I think what it might lead to is a more interesting forms and ways of digital theatre that uh, engage in a more interactive way with their audiences. Yeah, beautifully put. Um, so I guess we'll move towards, um, along the path of being a, a theatre critic <laughs> and what, what that means in, in as kind of a, a career path, as a profession. A lot of our, our writers do it as kind of hobbyists. And as you say, anyone with a blog can kind of do it. Do you think there is scope nowadays for someone who might want to pursue this professionally as their, as their main career track and main career path? Um, I think it would be very difficult to set out to be a uh, a critic, a theatre critic, and perhaps only a theatre critic. Uh, um, and to be perfectly honest, you know, I mean, that's certainly not what I set out to do. It's what I fell into. And I would always say that even though in this conversation I have kind of talked about being a critic and described myself as being a critic, I have to say... Uh, whenever uh, sort of somebody you know asks me to write down what my job is my fingers kind of hesitate over the keys uh, on the keyboard uh, when I talk about being a critic I mean at my most pretentious I'm afraid I would often say that I think I'm in a lucky enough position that actually um, I have uh, the privilege and opportunity to kind of think out loud about theatre uh, and I think that that is, in a way, what criticism is, because I don't think it is just about, um, uh, you know, writing about what you saw last night. It is about uh, 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 thinking about and kind of analysing and talking about uh, the whole kind of culture and industry of theatre as well. Uh, and what it means and why we have it and what theatre is and what it is that theatre can be in some ways. Definitely. I now, think the original question was, I think I went off on a bit of a tangent. No, I love it. Um, in, in terms of just like people going off and being critics, but then could you talk about oh, yes, no. other slashes of your existence as well? It's like obviously children's authorship is, a com is well, not co a completely different art form necessarily, but it's, it's another offshoot to the many... Uh, strings to your bow. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it has. And I think writing children's novels uh, uh, has been hugely enjoyable, but I think it's also uh, allowed a more of a creative outlet that I think uh, as somebody who for such a very long time was part of very much of mainstream criticism, mm. uh, was not able to write kind of reviews and journalism in a necessarily a particularly creative way mm. and I would also say you know one of the things I think we underestimate about the reason you know for going to the theatre and it, it's to do with any art um, but is um, you know going to the uh, to the theatre is it seems to me a launch pad and an inspiration for your own creativity uh, and, uh, you know, there are lots of things that find their way into my novels, which are absolutely to do with the fact that uh, I spend, you know, five nights a week. In the theatre. Um, stories. But can, I, can I? Sorry, Lindsay. Sorry. Oh, the number of stories that would have washed over you in, in a, any yeah, given. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, no, I think yeah, you know, you have uh, loads and loads of different fictions every night, and you know, about different stories being told in different ways. You know. um, uh, but I just want to go back to the question that you asked me and that I went off on a tangent when I said that I, I think it would be difficult to turn around and kind of say, oh, I am going to be a, a theatre critic. Yeah. What I think it is really possible to be uh, is somebody who writes about theatre and writes more broadly, perhaps, about culture as well. Uh, and I think that um, uh, it's harder to end up in a situation as I was lucky to do where um, I, uh, you know, had a, uh, 
a, a, a pretty well a full-time contract with a national newspaper mm. uh, but somebody's got to do it and people still do get those jobs and those jobs you know uh, are probably still only you know 10 or so of them actually kind of exist um, but I think that there are lots more opportunities to do lots more different things and one of the things I think that is fantastic for theatre and fantastic too for criticism and writing about theatre is that I think when I started out and I think for a good you know, 20 years or so after that, the idea that you might be a practitioner and make theatre and also write about it would uh, uh, have, uh, you know, been considered um, a complete no-no, I think. Uh, and now, actually, people do those two things in parallel. Uh, and I think that's absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. because, you know, there is something about people who are thinking about theatre and thinking about the wider culture and how that then actually folds into their own theatre practice that is really, really interesting. That is interesting. And also that there was maybe a divide. I've heard the same thing about directors and actors. Like you're on a certain yeah. side of that sort of the borderline and it, do not cross this line kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I mean, of course, another example of that would be actors and writers. Uh, which is that, uh, you know, it's really common now that people um, uh, both act and write. I, I think what we have come to accept, you know, a lot more is the idea that uh, people are um, theatre makers. Uh, you know, David Hare may not like the term, uh, but I actually think for a lot of people who may well describe themselves as being playwrights, nonetheless, they absolutely see what they do as being a collaborative process. And that isn't just giving lip service to that, you know, about saying, oh, well, you know, once we get into the rehearsal room, it is, you know, a collaborative process. Uh, but there is a difference uh, between that and actually turning around and saying, what is it that other people might bring to this process, which is in, as important as my text that I have brought to, um, to the process, yeah. you know? And, and I think, you know, one of the things I often think about is Krotowski, who of course, you know, talked about Hamlet and talked about the idea that Hamlet is, uh, Hamlet is not a play, it is an idea for a play. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely love that. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll go towards wrapping up because we're coming up on that lovely 40 minutes at the moment here. Um, and I'll ask you if you have any thoughts or any feelings or any vision for what the scene might look like when we start emerging from our self-isolation and our quarantines and our kind of segregation. Um, and I mean, I asked the same question to Simon Stevens. He's like, I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> and that, and it, it can be that. But if you have any hopes or any aspirations for that time when we can all be in the same room once again, what to you does that look like? Well, um, uh, I wish I had a crystal ball and then I would be able to answer that. <laughs> I, um, I would just say a few things. I think that, uh, uh, I think the landscape will look uh, different and I think partly that will be because there will be lots of losses I think there will be lots of uh, individuals and small companies who make theatre who sort of simply just go I cannot take this risk anymore uh, because they have found themselves as freelancers in an incredibly difficult situation and I think uh, that there will also be losses in terms of theatres uh, and theatre buildings. Uh, and in some cases, I think possibly quite significant theatre buildings. But I also think that um, uh, there will be good things that actually come out of this or that potentially we have the opportunity for good things to come out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because in some ways we will have, we are off the hamster wheel. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're off the hamster wheel of having to produce so much theater, uh, of getting into cycles of creation that are non-stop. You know, uh, we have stopped the cycle, in my case, of 
feeling I must go to the theatre five nights a week, otherwise I will be missing lots of things. So I think um, it is about actually turning around and saying, this is a, if not once in a generation, I think more than that, once in maybe a hundred years opportunity to actually turn around and say, oh, actually, we've fallen off the hamster wheel, yes, that we thought we couldn't get off, and how would we now like to reinvent that wheel, yes, uh, in some way? Could it be that the wheel will look completely different? Maybe if we won't have to run so fast on it. Uh, maybe it will now be a square or a triangle, or it will have spikes in it. <laughs> and I think that that is really, really important because actually I think there have been a number of opportunities in the past when we might have been able to rethink what theatre is, who it's for, why it's there. And, uh, you know, one of those I think was uh, just over 10 years ago after the uh, economic crash uh, in 2008. And I think we haven't and done haven't done those things and um, the thing that cheers me sort of most about um what has happened at the moment is uh you know when i look around and see those companies like slung low who are turning around and saying why are we an M why are we mpo funded what is a theater company for what it is that we might do to be most useful and i think there are examples of theatres all over the country where their workshops are now being used to make uh, PPE or uh, stuff for the National Health Service, uh, where um, uh, the lorries that they have had are being used to help make deliveries for essential equipment for health workers. And I think all those are things uh, that actually, um, you know, that uh, are signs of, um, you know, something that makes me optimistic. I think what would be really so sad is if we looked at this not as an opportunity to reinvent ourselves, but instead saw it uh, as something where we're just trying to get back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Well, that seems like a very lovely note to be winding things down. Is there any final words, any last minute things you wish I'd asked that we didn't get to throughout the, the course of the chat here today? No, but uh, just actually to say thank you so much and how honoured I am to be asked by a younger theatre, you know, somebody as old as I am uh, to talk to an audience who, uh, you know, are, are the future. And that's just brilliant. Thank you very much indeed for asking me. It is genuinely all ours. You've been an absolute joy. And I'm leaving feeling very uplifted myself, <laughs> all this to say. And yeah, looking forward to whatever comes.